case is a, uh, a little bit unusual. It's a 38-year-old uh, woman who presents with, uh, unfortunately, what are very common symptoms for ovarian cancer, uh, with abdominal bloating, a distension, abdominal pain. Uh, it's not uncommon for women to have these kinds of symptoms for several months uh, before uh, really medical evaluation has taken place. Um, but uh, ultimately, uh, she presents. Obviously, there's something abnormal that's found on her exam, and that prompts a, um, uh, a series of, of, of next steps. So one of the first next steps was that blood was drawn for a CON25, which is not uncommon to draw when the suspicion is ovarian cancer. And the second was that she had imaging done uh, to evaluate the areas that this disease can spread, um, which is most commonly in the abdominal cavity. Um, but I think going through the clinician's mind at the time of presentation is that you have a, a young woman. Uh, young women uh, are not in the usual spectra for patients who have advanced uh, you know, epithelial ovarian cancer. And so other ovarian malignancies need to be under that consideration. So frequently what we would draw in, in addition to CON25 would be other markers for germ cell tumors, for instance, uh, to make sure that that was um, co completely ruled out. But nonetheless, uh, she does get an imaging study done which shows that she has intra-abdominal disease. Um, the disease is typically bulky, and uh, this was a, the case in, in, uh, in, the, in this particular patient. And it was uh, uh, seen with ascites and large volume of disease in the upper abdomen. That's very common a distribution for the intraperitoneal carcinomatosis that we see in, in women who have high-grade serous or have a uh, ovarian cancer malignancy that's spread. Uh, and then I think in a, uh, an important event happened, and that was that she was referred to a gynecologic oncologist. So sometimes these patients uh, meet, are, are first introduced to the system through their gynecologist, or they may be introduced to the system through their inter internist. So one of the, we think, uh, one of the key pieces to the management um, for women who have ovarian cancer is that they're referred to a gynecologic oncologist who can make a decision as to whether or not surgery should be done or not. Uh, and uh, if surgery is chosen, they understand what the goals of that surgery are. Uh, and in this case, the patient was uh, seen and was taken to surgery, and she had a complete re resection of visible disease. So in that process, there were several decisions that needed to be made. One was that this was a resectable process. Uh, two, a diagnosis needed to be made. And three, that the patient was taken to surgery and had a complete resection of all tumor. And that is uh, really our ultimate goal and what we would now consider an optimal side of reduction. So, so from that standpoint, she uh, received uh, probably the best initial approach to care that she could get. And then um, once the diagnosis was confirmed, um, in this case it was an endometrioid uh, ovarian cancer, and this is one of the histology subtypes that we see with ovarian cancer. Uh, the most common, what I call the vanilla uh, of, the, uh, of the ovarian cancer epithelial tumors is usually serous, uh, of the serous variety. In this particular case, it was an unusual, slightly unusual type, uh, endometrioid. And endometrioid uh, is just uh, like it sounds. The oid part of the endometrioid uh, uh, means like, and like endometrioid means like the uterus. So the endometrioid uh, tumors are cells that under the microscope will look very endometrial. Uh, in, in, it, in their shape and their character. Um, these types of lesions are seen in young women, particularly in young women who have uh, epithelial ovarian cancers arising in endometriosis. So you may hear this term sometimes uh, uh, as an endometriosis, a, a cancer arising in endometriosis. And the cell types that we see that typically accompany that pathology are endometrioid or clear cell. So, unusual cell type, but uh, would be consistent with her young age at presentation. And then I think the, uh, the, the last kind of important step that was done as part of this initial evaluation and, and treatment was that she had her, um, uh, that, that she was tested for the BRCA genes. So um, we have now uh, learned that family history and uh, personal history uh, can only provide so much of the information that's necessary to identify all the patients that potentially could carry uh, the BRCA, uh, aberrations in the BRCA genes in the germline. Um, in the young, younger age women, we certainly expect um, that there's, this is kind of fits the profile for that, but 38 is actually a young age even in, among the cohort of patients that are identified with BRCA1 or 2 germline mutations. 
Um, however, it's not necessarily that unusual to see um, uh, uh, aberrations of this type in some of the other cell types other than endometri other than uh, serous carcinomas of the ovary. So I do think that this is probably a reasonable thing to do. Um, and it was done. And she was found to be BRCA1 and 2 negative. Um, and, um, and while people may say, wow, that's unusual because she's so young, in the endometriosis-associated cancers, if that's what this case is, it wouldn't necessarily be that unusual. It would be associated with young age, but not necessarily associated with the BRCA1 or 2 mutations.